gather round the mysteries of love and our broken history. The grace heals the fall lines in me time and time again. Welcomes me in to a, a house for the hungry, a well for the thirsty. We're all saints, come together, shoulder to shoulder, welcome for the traveler, new wine for the vineyard, in all things, God is able, love has a bigger table. birthday church I wish you happy birthday on two counts number one today is Pentecost the day in the uh, liturgical calendar where we celebrate the birthday of the Christian church and it also coincides with uh, Strawbridge's 40th birthday today so Congratulations, you're all 40 years old today. Uh, and thank you, by the way, Strawbridge, for the way that you have been um, a place where folks over the years can find a refuge, find a bigger table that love has prepared for them. Uh, and so um, as a senior pastor, my name is Todd Jordan. I welcome you all and want you all to know that when we say you are all welcome, here at Strawbridge, we mean you are all welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. Uh, if you're joining us online, a special welcome to you as well, wherever you are. Just want to um, let you know that, that this morning is a little bit of a special service. If you're visiting with us, a special welcome to you. You might notice the uh, 
a few of us have on the same clothes. Uh, we are at Commitment Sunday for our, our Embrace the Spirit campaign. We need to do some building and, and we need to raise resources to do some of that expansion. So that's what this is about. So some of you, uh, all of our members and regular visitors, received a commitment card in the mail prior to this Sunday. And some of you, well, all of you have been asked to pray about it and pray about supporting the campaign. Some of you are ready to return your commitment card today. So you'll be given a chance to do that. You can place them in the baskets during the last hymn. I'll give you a heads up before we get there. If you don't have your uh, if you don't have your commitment card with you, we do have them strategically placed throughout the congregation, including at the end of all the pews with pens. So if you want to fill that out, you're more than welcome to. If you're a first-time guest, please don't worry about that. Uh, just, just enjoy the worship uh, here. And if you don't have your card or you're not ready to turn in your card, you're worshiping with us online, you can do that over any time over the next few weeks. Mail it to the church when you're ready uh, or hit the QR our code on our website. So for now, what I want to simply do is invite you to take a deep breath. I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is present in our midst, opening our hearts and minds, drawing us closer to one another, closer to God. God has something in store for us in worship this morning. So I want you to give yourself permission to give yourself over to this moment and allow God to Holy Spirit to blow, how God's Holy Spirit will blow. And as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, I'm going to invite Grace Leith to come up and get us started in our call to worship this morning. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. God has gathered us to this place where we hear those stories which show us what the kingdom of God is like. God summons us to this place where we can learn how to serve God without reservation or hesitation. God will send us from this place to tell others of God's hopes and dreams so they too can first follow God. Amen. affirm our faith together. We believe that God is present in the darkness before dawn, in the waiting and uncertainty where fear and courage join hands, conflict and caring link arms, and the sun rises over barbed wire. We believe in a with us God who sits down in our midst to share our humanity. 
We affirm a faith that takes us beyond the safe place, into action, into vulnerability, and into the streets. We commit ourselves to work for change and put ourselves on the line to bear responsibility, take risks, live powerfully, and face humiliation, to stand with those on the edge, to choose life and be used by the Spirit for God's new community of hope. Amen. you to be seated as we turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Creator, sustainer, and redeemer, you, God, are three in one, holy trinity. You created this amazing earth and all living things and called each one good. By the touch of your Holy Spirit, you sustain this world and each of us, guiding us to return to you. You, O oh God, are like the Father who welcomes home all who have wandered away and continue to love those who have remained close to you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have redeemed your people. Lord, today we gather to celebrate the work you have done among and through Strawbridge as it cel celebrates its 40th birthday and as it looks forward to the next 40 years. You have called your people for just such a time as this, to expand your table, to welcome all, and to provide a room, room for all who desire to come. We praise you for all who have already committed themselves to your work in this community, and thank you for all who will do so this morning. In a little while, as we offer our gifts to you, equip us to give freely and without reservation, and use these gifts to grow your kingdom and expand the reach of your love into this community and the world. And we also pray for those who are in need. We lift up to you, Lord, the needs and concerns of the world and of these, your people. For all the places where there is war, we pray for peace, that those who are bringing up arms against one another would lay them down and instead embrace each other in the love and charity that you call us to. And we pray for children. Where there are children who are going hungry, would you move your people to give them food and shelter? We lift up all people who have been made homeless or forced to flee their homeland, that you, O oh Lord, would provide a safe and welcoming place for them and their families. Jesus, you are the great physician, and so we lift to you those who are ill or are battling cancer, that you would bring healing to them. Comfort those who mourn the loss of a loved one. And we pray especially for those who have received a difficult diagnosis, that you would surround them with your comfort and your care and give them strength for this journey. And we pray for the healthcare workers who provide the hope and healing that is given through you to so many who are ill. Give them strength and wisdom for their work, and may they know that you are the source of all cures. Today we pray especially for those who have been impacted in our community by the flooding, by wind damage, and loss of electricity, especially those who cannot seek a new place to live or do not have the means to go to a place with cooling. Lord, we pray for them and ask that you would mobilize us, your people, to bring aid and help to those in need. We also pray for those who are here to help work to restore power, to clean flooded homes, and to remove trees. Would you give them stamina for this time and safety as they work to help us restore our community? We pray these things knowing and trusting in your promise to hear and answer our prayers as we unite our voices together to pray the prayer you taught the disciples praying. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite our children to come forward for their time with Pastor Emily. Good morning. Come on down. I'm so excited to see you this morning. I love the shirt you picked out today. It looks so nice and fun. Come on down. You found a good spot. Good morning. So have you ever seen the movie Aladdin? Have you seen that movie? The movie Aladdin with Aladdin and the genie and the lamp? He has it ringing, is it ringing a bell? And he finds a lamp and he rubs it and what happened? The genie pops out and what does Aladdin get to do? He gets to make some wishes, right? So th three, that's right. So you gotta get that three. So if you could wish, if you could wish for anything, what would you wish for? Like someone in first service wanted a unicorn they could fly around on. That was their wish. What would you wish for? A horse. Okay. I like it. To talk to Jesus. That would be a wonderful thing. What would you wish for, Coleman? You want to be rich? Is that what you said? I do too, Coleman. I want to be rich too. <laughs> what do you wish for? Get your power back, yes, for sure. Just visit heaven and then come back. I like that. All right, I like that. Yeah. What you think? To stay what? To stay home some days. I get it. Sometimes you want to stay home. I get that. What do anybody else wish? What would you wish for? A dog. All right, Lily. What would you wish for? To not go to school? Well, you're, you're about to have the summer off. So, yeah? What would you wish for? Not like to get anything you want. Okay. All right. Close. Tell me, and then we'll finish with Ruth. Snow? Snow? I think everybody always wants that. Tell me. Snowball? Okay, Michael, now you finish us. What do you wish for? You thinking? Okay. You know what I might, other than flying around, you know what else I might reach for? Kind of like Coleman. I would want a lot of money, right? Right? A lot of, a lot of money, money. And you know, there's, a, there's someone in the Bible. Have you heard of the prodigal son? Have you heard of that? Can you say prodigal son? Yeah. And he kind of he kind of had a wish. He, and you know what? He, he kind of wished he wanted to have a lot of money, right? Hang on just a second. He wanted money. And so guess what he did? He went to his dad and he said, Dad, I, I wish to have all the money I'm going to get one day, and I want to go out and be on, his, uh, on my own. And so guess what he did? Guess what he did? He took all his money. He went out on his own. And guess what happened to all of his money? It's gone. The first, it disappeared, as the little boy said in the first service. He had a large time. Hang on just a second. You want to tell me something? Okay, tell me, because you're about to explode. And the famine came. And so what, what does that mean? He got really what? Hungry. And he started working with pigs. Now, who would wish to work with pigs? Nobody. You want to work with pigs? All right. Are there some, you like them? Okay, but guess what? He was so hungry. He had spent all his money. He had a large time that he would said, I'm so hungry that I would even eat what the pigs eat. Uh, mud. Yes, mud. Slop. Yeah, he would, I don't, let's not eat the pigs. I don't know. I don't know. I, maybe. At least it would be pork, right? All right, so anyway, he was so hungry, guess what? He wanted to eat the pig slop. Yeah, so guess what he decided he should do? He didn't eat the pigs, nope. He, okay, all right, guess what he did? Thomas is about to erupt. Tell me, Thomas. <laughs> he gets the money again. And then he, uh, 
He's like, I'm so hungry. I have nothing else that I'm going to do. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to be a slave to my daddy because there's no way I'm going to be loved like I was once before. So guess what happened? He go, go ahead, Thomas. Go for it. I love it. It works for me. Yep. Yep. That's right. They're like, party. My son is home. You're not grounded. You're not in timeout. You are, you are loved and you are embraced and we're going to have a big party for you because he was celebrated that he made that right choice and came back home and yes, Thomas, and then we're going to pray. And then the brothers got jealous, but we're going to save that for part two another day because <laughs> Pastor Todd's only getting us to the embracing and excited piece. All right? I love it. I love it. And you know what's so exciting about, about all of this is that no matter where we, where we go, the, the choices that we make, we can always be welcome at church, at home, to be loved by God, to buy this wonderful ch church family, that no matter where you come from or what choices you made last night or years past, you were always welcome in church. And you know, I was thinking as you were getting ready to, to have summer, right, and not be at school, there's a, lots of things that you can do this summer here at church that you can embrace and know how much God loves you. So you pray with me? You guys were awesome today. But don't eat pig slop, okay? It's gross. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for every child at my feet this morning. And those who are here this morning or are on their way or who watched online, God, I hope that you know how much they love you and so do their families. God, help us to remember that no matter if we spend all our money or we save it and give it all away, no matter what, God, you always love us and welcome us in. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. As the kids head back to your seat, I invite you to watch our Embrace the Spirit video this morning. Thanks for coming. Thanks for Hello, coming. church. Thanks. I'm Carol Bowden. I'd like to share a few thoughts with you today about gratitude. It's been almost two years since I first came to Strawbridge. It had been a tough time in my faith walk. We were in the middle of a church split and I had been told in person to my face that my beliefs were all wrong, that I didn't understand the Bible. And to me, Jesus was just another guy. Even though I felt they were wrong, it really hurt. It made me doubt myself. After all, these words came from friends that I respected and trusted, and they were reinforced by the pastor's words. My Sunday worship became filled with uncertainty. Then I came to Strawbridge. I entered the sanctuary a broken, fearful person. I was sure I'd be called out for my unworthiness to be there. But I was greeted with welcoming, open arms. There were genuine smiles for me. The message at Strawbridge was that everyone was welcome and everyone was loved. But as messed up as I was, I still wondered if that really included me. As I continued to attend on Sundays, I realized God was present. I could hear him in the message. I could see the Holy Spirit in the people surrounding me. And I was beginning to feel loved again. I am eternally grateful that God brought me to Strawbridge. He knew how to show me that I had value. As I reflect on those times, I realize now that I would go through all of it again. All of the sleepless nights, anxiety and confusion, just to be a part of Strawbridge. Thank you, God. Thank you, church family. Please stand as we lift our voices in gratitude together. All my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express? Could sing these songs as 
I often do But every song must I invite you to remain standing for the reading of our scripture. Well, Thomas covered this, but <laughs> our scripture is Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. And 
A big thank you to all of those who are working with our children and nurturing them in the word that they know this, it's on their heart. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he is still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Chapter 1, The Kittens. When I was in the fourth or fifth grade, I remember walking home one day. Um, my elementary uh, in Sugarland was just literally a block and a half from the house. But on this particular day, it was a Thursday afternoon, and it was raining. And when I say it was raining, it was raining like the heavy rains that we've seen recently, the kind that fill up the ditches in just a couple of hours. And that's exactly what had happened. By the time I had gone, walked home in this, uh, and all the ditches uh, uh, on the way to the house were completely full, overflowing, st streets were flooding, and it was just coming down in sheets and I was drenched and so I walk in the door and I'll never forget I look in the dining room immediately to the right and there was something I did not expect to see on the table was a cardboard box and directly over the box was a lamp shining right on it this is odd now I was the only one home my my dad was working my mom was working and my brother was in junior high I always got home first so I went over to the box and I looked in and what I it took me a while to see because it was just like this mass blob of fur with little appendages everywhere and it seems to be by my count four distinct heads belonging to four little itty bitty kittens I mean they were little like and fast asleep like barely you know like the age to where their eyes had just opened and I just was like where did these kittens come from my my, my parents were not the, the type to just go out and adopt kittens and we already had a cat a big old tom cat and I knew they weren't from him uh, at any rate, he had been fixed years before, uh, so had nothing to do with Heathcliff, our other cat. I just, we just sat there, and of course, they were as cute as could be. So finally, when my dad comes home, I was like, Dad, where did these kittens come from? And he says, you're never going to guess what happened. He says, when I came home this afternoon for lunch, the way he always did, and of course the rain was coming down on the car, so, so over the rain he had the radio turned up extra loud, and when he pulled into the driveway above the radio, above the rain, he thought he heard some cries. So he turns off the radio, he turns off the car, and he listens, and sure enough, he hears some strange crying. And he can't imagine what that would be in the middle of a rainstorm. So he gets out in the rain and it's just pouring. And he goes across the street 
in the ditch that's, that's at this point filling up very quickly with water, there is this bag. And it's moving. And it's shrieking with this blood-curdling noise. He opens, his, opens it up, and it's four kittens that someone had thrown out. So instantly his heart goes out to them and he brings them into the house and he finds the box. He puts a nice soft blanket for them to lay gently on in the, the lamp. And then he calls up the vet and he says, I found these kittens, what do I do? And he, when he explains how big they are and how far along they are in development, the vet says, well, listen, first of all, let me temper your expectations. You'll be lucky if one or two of them survive. But you also need to know that they're very reliant on mama at this stage in their life. And they're not going to eat kibble and they're not going to drink from a water bowl. You're going to have to hand feed them formula. So um, he, you know, he got the formula and he got the dropper. He says, you, you, the vet explained you have to hold them by hand and let them drink their fill. And dad says, okay, I, I think I can handle that. There's four of them. It'll be a little overwhelming, but we can handle that. And then um, the vet says, yeah, well, that's not it. The hard part is um, kittens of that age won't go to the bathroom on their own. Mama signals it to them. And she does this by licking their bottom. Dad says, I am not licking those cats. I am sorry. I draw the... The vet says, you don't need to. The vet says, what you will need to do, though, after every feeding time, all four of them, you need a bowl of warm water and you take a cotton ball and you hold the kitten in your hand and you wipe until everything that needs to come out comes out. And you have to do this for every kitten at every feeding time. And dad's like, okay, I think I can handle that, what, once or twice a day? No, every four hours. Every four hours during the day? No, every four hours around the clock in order to keep them alive. And so, you know, of course we helped, um, but dad took the night hours. And so it was Thursday, it was a Thursday that we got them. The next day school was not in because of the flooding. So we were out, so we were able to help. But I can just tell you that by Saturday morning, my dad, who had gotten up two nights in a row to take care of all four kittens, to feed them and clean up after them, was absolutely exhausted. And I can't help but think of the father and the prodigal son that love stops at nothing to take care of those whom we love. This is what love does. So, so why would my dad do such a thing? Why would my dad take care of these kittens that he didn't ask for, wasn't looking for, wasn't even necessarily interested in helping? My guess is that my dad had a heart that knew something. My dad has a heart that knows something about love and compassion. That it's somewhere along the line, my dad learned that it's not just about receiving love and compassion. It, it is about extending and sharing it to others. So when Jesus calls us to discipleship, when Jesus calls us to support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, when Jesus sends us into the world to make disciples, we have to remember that we don't do so as a chore or as a task or as a have to. We are to do so out of gratitude. That it was God who loved us first. God who would stop at nothing to love us, to claim us, to name us first. God who would stop at nothing, even if it meant going all the way to the cross, would love us the way the father embraces a prodigal son, would love us the way my dad cradled those kittens and hand-fed them in the late hours of the night. This is who God is. The prodigal son, the parable, is not so much uh, about the prodigal son as it is about God and God's generosity. As much about God's grace as it is about us and our sin and our woundedness and our brokenness. And it is a reminder that apart from God's grace, you and I are as helpless as that broke uh, prodigal son pining after pig slop, as helpless as a bagged kitten, 
in a quickly filling ditch. So in the parable, as we heard, the prodigal son basically goes to his dad at the beginning of the story and says, you know, I want you to to give me my inheritance now, which was essentially saying, you're dead to me. As far as I care, you, you, you are only worth to me what I can see in dollar signs. And this would have been a very disrespectful, very selfish, very dishonorable thing to do. And nonetheless, the father apparently sells the son's portion of, of their property, gives him the cash, and then the son, of course, we know, goes to a faraway land and just completely squanders it, right? And finds himself so broke, so poor. Okay, now think about this. Uh, he is working in a land that raises pigs, right? So this is not Israel. Pigs for, for Jewish people were considered unclean. The land in which they were, the people that handled them were unclean, Gentiles, right? The pigs themselves were unclean. So for, for the prodigal son to be wanting to eat what the pigs were eating, that would have been of, as offensive to the first hearers of the parable as it is disgusting to you and I. Words cannot describe how humiliating, how low, how horrible one would have to find themselves in order to yearn for pig slop, especially in that culture. This would not have been lost to them. He is as low as they get, as it gets. So the son coming to his senses in a moment of clarity realizes, you know, my father's servants, even the poorest of them have it better than this. At least they have a roof over their heads and, and a meal on the table. So I'm going to go home and, 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 and confess that I have disgraced my father, insulted him, squandered everything for my own selfish giving. So he goes home with his tail between his legs, so to speak, confesses, he repents, begs for mercy, and says, look, I'll just, just hire me as a hired hand. The father does not hear of it. This is not going to happen as far as the father's concerned. In fact, Jesus lets us know that before the son even arrives, what is the father doing? Running to him. It's as if he's on the lookout for his son right? That relationship, that covenant has not been broken. And you might recall when I was talking a week ago about Zacchaeus, about men running in public, lifting up their cloaks to run in public was considered dishonorable and disgraceful. Jesus is telling us we have a God that will stop at nothing to claim us and face even humiliation that we might know that we have a place in God's kingdom. And the king and the, the father embraces the son, puts sandals on his feet, a ring on his finger, and says, you're not just back home. You're back home as my child. You belong to me. This is what love is. This is what God does for you and I. This is the why we do what we do as Christians. God makes room for the lost and the last and the least. And God's grace is for everybody. Not unlike like my own dad uh, making his way through the rain for these kittens to find them a warm, cozy bed and stay up all night taking care of them. God will stop at nothing to see to it that every one of his children has a place in his kingdom. I share this with you because this is Strawbridge's mission. This is who we are, what we've done for the past 40 years. Hundreds of people, including you and I, coming to this place, finding refuge amidst the storms in the world, finding a place where we are loved, accepted, and welcome. A place where we can worship. A place that we can call home a place that we can learn and grow, a place from which to be sent into the world to be hands and feet for Christ, whether next door or across the way, across the sea. And so our Embrace the Spirit campaign, as I've stated before, is ultimately not just a, a campaign about building or raising the resources to, 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 for that building to happen. Ultimately, Embrace the Spirit campaign is our mission to make room for anyone and everyone on the journey, 
on their spiritual journey, anyone, uh, even those who are unclear of their journey, to make a place at Strawbridge United Methodist Church. The world needs us to be a place where people can love and think, a place to receive and be received, a place to serve and be served without restriction, without reservation, without conditions, a place where everyone is welcome and where everyone actually means everyone. A place that is fully inclusive, fully affirming, with no more judgment or condemnation to anyone else than Jesus gives to you and I. Chapter 2, Mama. So that Saturday, my dad is wiped out. I mean, he's exhausted. He's been up for the past two nights, and he is praying to the Lord. He is praying, oh God, um, that's me, sorry. Uh, he is praying to God, I need some help in this. He is exhausted. Uh, he's a pastor. He's associate pastor at the Methodist Church there in Sugarland at the time. His job was to give a, a children's sermon in, uh, in that Sunday morning. He had work to do, and he needed some relief. And so he was praying hard that something would change. And um, about 5 o'clock or five, 6 o'clock that evening, uh, his prayers were answered. We were watching TV on the couch that Saturday afternoon or evening, and all of a sudden we heard a blood-curdling howl. I mean, it was it's the kind of noise that makes your hair stand on, on the back of your neck. And we looked at each other and we were like, what is that horrible noise? And then all of a sudden he thought, you don't think. So we go, I'm not making this up, we go outside, open the garage door, and there is the saddest, most miserable, scrawny, skinny, gray female cat we've ever seen in our lives. And she has that look the way mama kittens look, or mama cats look when they've just given birth, you know? And she is just howling at the top of her lungs. And dad's thinking, I don't care if this is their mama kitty or another mama kitty, she's got the job. <laughs> so he tries to entice her to come into the garage. He gets a little bowl of water, he thinks she must be thirsty, puts the bowl out, out there, she does, she's just howling. Then he gets some kit, cat food, some kitty kibble uh, that we use for Heathcliff, put that in a bowl, put it out no attention, just howling. He's like, I don't know what to do. How do we get her in? And then uh, all of a sudden, uh, he gets this idea. So he goes and gets a bag, and he very gently places the kittens in the bag. Then he takes the bag out to the garage, lays it down with the open end toward Mama Cat so she can see. Mama Cat, I kid you not. She passes by the water. She passes by the food, and she goes straight into the bag and gently grabs one of the kittens by the scruff of its neck, pulls it over to the corner, and then back for the second, back for the third, back for the fourth, gathers them up in the corner, and instantly they start nursing, and instantly she starts purring. She's found a home. Um, Y'all, this is God's grace. This is what God does. How long was she out there in the neighborhood all this time? How far had she traveled looking for her babies? Not interested in food, not interested in water, interested in finding her own. This is who God is. Like the prodigal, like the father running to embrace the prodigal son, like this mama cat who seeks out her babies, does not rest, does not falter, does not stop until all are accounted for. This is who God is. Y'all, this is our mission. Strawbridge United Methodist Church, we need to go into the community and let folks know we are here for them. Who we are, what we do. But you need to know we're limited right now. Because there are many Sunday mornings where the parking lot is full, where Sunday school classes are full, where there's not enough room in the nursery, and so we're limited on who we can invite to our church. 
a successful Embrace the Spirit campaign that results in the added space in the parking and facilities that we need frees us to invite anyone and everyone to our place of refuge, this place of refuge uh, from the storm of the world's divisiveness, from the world's spiritual confusion, from the anxiety and the cruelty. Y'all, Strawbridge United Methodist Church is special. There are people worshiping with us here this morning who only feel welcome in a church like Strawbridge, who only feel comfortable in a church like Strawbridge. And you know as well as I do, there are more in our community. If we do not make space for them, who will? Please pray about how you will support our efforts to not just be the best church for the community but actually have a literal place for those in the community who may choose to disciple and apostle here. Chapter 3, The Confession. The next Sunday morning, the next Sunday morning, my dad gives the children's sermon, as he always does every Sunday, this time on the kitten story. After worship, two kids come up to my dad, a, a brother and a sister, and they say, um, Reverend Jordan, can we talk to you? And he says, yes. <laughs> that was our dad. My dad says, what? That was our dad that put the kittens in the bag and threw it out the car window. He drove four miles from his house in order to be away from anyone that might know him for what he would do, and as it happened, did so a block away, not a block, across the street from his own associate pastor without realizing it. Dad said, really? He says, oh, yes. He was tired of this mama kitten or mama cat giving birth to kittens underneath our porch. So he bagged them up to throw them out and got mama cat, was going to throw her out too. Somehow she, got, uh, she escaped before we could get there. So she had been traveling all over, going house to house in search of her babies. And now dad knew who did it. But I don't recall dad ever confronting him. I don't recall my dad ever uh, preaching a sermon to him or giving him a lecture or chastising or condemning or judgment. You know what I believe my dad did? I believe my dad felt like his loving act in the face of the other man's cruelty was conviction. I believe this is exactly how God is. The father does not need to chastise the prodigal son, give him a lecture, or punish him. What the dad does is contrast the selfishness and the cruelty with generosity and grace. It is as if the father is saying, I will match your hatred, I will match your disrespect with unmatchless love and acceptance and unconditional mercy. And this is who we are called to be as a church. We don't need to judge the world. We don't need to lecture the world. We don't need to condemn the world. What we need to do is live out God's call to show grace and mercy to one another, to treat others how God treats us. In the face of our unfaithfulness, cruelty, and selfishness, God responds with love Strawbridge United Methodist Church can convict the world of its hatred, of its anger, and of the vitriol that we see in our culture and our politics today, and contrast that with love and compassion. You and I have an opportunity to be an instrument of God's grace and exemplify to the world the right way to do church. And the more we welcome into our midst, the more we convict with our love, grace, and mercy, the more we teach in compassion and reach in compassion, the more we influence through our faith and action, the more we send into the world to do the same for others. Chapter 4. 
and they lived happily ever after. All four kittens survived. All four of them survived. They grew. They got strong. Uh, Mama Cat, uh, she did great. We brought her into the house. Uh, they were part of the family until they were strong enough. And then we found uh, loving homes for all of them to, to be named and claimed, including Mama. And um, as far as I knew, they grew up to be happy, healthy cats. Um, and that's what we want to see. Um, just like the prodigal son finds a home uh, in his home to be not just another servant, not just another person, but actually a, a child, of a part of the family. Uh, Strawbridge United Methodist Church is called to be, it, it is a home for you and I, a refuge for you and I. We are called to be this for many in the world. And I simply ask that God would grant that we would embrace the Spirit and make room for them. Amen. I invite our ushers to come forward as, as we prepare for this morning's offering. I just want to clarify that this is offering is for our normal offering. You'll be invited in here in just a few minutes if you want to make your commitment to the Embrace the Spirit campaign that would be separate from this time of giving. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather on this celebration Sunday, we are reminded of the transformative power of your Holy Spirit that through your spirit you breathe life into the earth, church and you ignite the hearts of your people. And, O oh Lord, as you enliven the early church with the wind and fire of your presence, we pray that you would empower Strawbridge to be a beacon of welcome and love in the brokenness of our community and world. Please use these offerings, gracious God, today to be a sign of our commitment to embrace the spirit of your compassion and love for all people. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.
Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to return back to you a small portion of which you've already given to us in abundance through Christ. We simply ask that you would receive these gifts, bless them, multiply them, send them into the world for the building of your kingdom, that you may be glorified in Jesus Christ. Amen. Whenever we gather for worship, it is an opportunity to receive the word of God and to respond to the word of God. For some of you that have your commitment cards and are ready to turn them in, I invite you to do so. If not, uh, you've got time, pray about it. You can send them in over the next couple of weeks. If you're worshiping with us online and you want to give or know more how to want to know more about how to give, uh, call the church office. We'd love to chat with you about that. Fill out the commitment card or find the scan. Uh, QR code online. Uh, but for those of you with commitment cards and ready to turn them in, the baskets are ready for you as we continue standing and singing and praising God. Honest offering, I surrender all.
Thank you for worshiping with us today. Thank you for supporting the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. God is doing and will do amazing things for us and through us. I uh, want to remind you, we are hosting Family Promise starting next Sunday. We can use some volunteers with that. So if you usually help with that, if you'll let Carla know. Carla Hopkins, are you, you made it all good. Uh, so see Carla after worship if you want to know more about uh, Family Promise or how you can help. Or contact the church office and we'll get you plugged into that as well. And just want to remind you that there is a picnic for us waiting um, with bouncy houses and all sorts of goodies. So that's immediately following worship. So on your way out, the, the nine o'clock worship folks are already out there. It's okay. Um, go, we'll go join them. And thank you for all the ways you are living in such a way that we'll let the world know about God's grace that just can't be stopped. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. 